Can't live without wool? Neither can the sheared animals. PETA's landmark mohair investigation continues the crackdown in the industry. Now it's up to consumers to show why they want vegan clothing. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, PETA's mohair investigation leads to a real crackdown in South Africa, where Angora goats are raised. Now, for the first time, that country's National Council of Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals have filed cruelty to animals charges against four Angora goat farmers, and law enforcement begins to look at how Angora wool is processed. It's not pretty. These workers are getting paid by how much volume uh, they're shearing off of these animals, and not really by the hour. Um, So we saw that workers consistently were dragging goats by their horns, by their legs, slamming them onto the shearing floor, uh, holding them down as they were crying, whether because they were in pain, because they were being cut open by these shears, because the shears are moving so quickly. Some of these goats were considered spent by the shears and were taken to a different part of the shearing shed and had their throats slit with these dull knives. So these animals were writhing in pain and crying out in pain as it took several seconds for these workers to slit their throats and then finally break their necks. Christina Sewell is PETA's assistant manager of clothing campaigns. She talks about the significance of the investigation and how it's brought on a new awareness of the growing demand for vegan fashion. Sewell also talks about her personal transformation to veganism and how being a captain in the army led her to PETA. At the time, I remember all of my friends in the military were advising me against it saying that you're going to be blacklisted from military or government work going forward. (laughs) PETA's crazy. They just want to make the whole world vegan. And I was like, that sounds pretty great. (laughs) More on that and how the PETA mohair Angora wool investigation continues to change the industry and drive efforts like the development of vegetable cashmere. All that next on the PETA podcast. But first, Thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast. Please share a link with your friends and let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. You can go to our webpage at PETA.org and binge up on some of my favorites. I do like the inaugural episode with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk, who debunks all the myths you've heard about PETA and animal rights. Hear why PETA is against snowkill shelters. That's in episode one. You can also hear Ingrid's words on why mothers on the southern border should never have been separated from their children. That's on episode 24. A cow is a child is an immigrant. Since this episode you're listening to is about the Mohair investigation, listen to episode 16 and PETA's executive vice president, Tracy Ryman, who talks about the Mohair investigation and how it's part of an overall PETA strategy to get companies to be more ethical when it comes to using animals in their products. So binge up. And remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high-tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode, cracking down on the mohair trade and the cruel treatment of Angora sheep. PETA made news worldwide in South Africa when, for the very first time, the National Council of Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the NCSPCA, filed cruelty to animal charges against four Angora goat farmers. After PETA provided the undercover footage and the Washington Post reported the story, the NCSPCA has now begun the legal process which could lead to prosecution of shearers, punishable by up to a year in prison. 
Now it's up to shoppers to vote with their dollars and reject the cruelty behind the mohair industry. Peter's Christina Sewell is the assistant manager of clothing campaigns and talks about how the processing of mohair is nothing like a haircut. And she talks about her own personal journey to veganism after leaving a military career as a captain in the army. Here's my interview with Peter's Christina Sewell on the continuing impacts of Peter's landmark mohair investigation on the Peter podcast. You know, the South African Police Service, they have to investigate these farmers now, um, all of these shares and farm workers from the 12 farms that our investigator visited during that time. So this is this is really big. This is going to possibly uh, preclude these shearers from working in these sheds and farms, just like how we saw in our recent wool investigation with the charges uh, there against six shears, because pretty much, you know, the treatment against these animals was the same. They were punching them, holding them down on the floor, throwing them on the ground, mutilating these animals, cutting off bits of their ears and teeth and genitalia. And, you know, we, we needed to document all of this so that we could share it with the public and really get uh, not only consumers, but businesses in the know of what goes on behind closed doors in these industries. But this is really going to set a precedent for the industry if, if these charges are fully seen through. It, the NSPCA it is going to force this investigation by, by bringing the, these charges. Now it forces the, 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 uh, the law enforcement wing to get in there and investigate. We'll see. They have to go through several hundred pages of documentation uh, and see if they can convict um, these shears for the violations of basically killing these animals slowly with dull knives, breaking their necks, throwing them down to the ground and breaking their spinal cords and so many other egregious and cruel behaviors towards these animals. We're talking about the individual farmers that mm -hmm. were pinpointed in our footage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for the mohair investigation, the uh, NSPCA filed cruelty to animals charges against four specific Angora goat farmers. But that's going to set a huge precedent for the entire industry. All right. Now, you mentioned the Washington Post uh, investigation. That's when the mo mohair case was first released. Remind our listeners, what, what exactly is mohair? It's from goats? It's wool mm -hmm. from goats? or It's the really soft woolen type uh, of hair that comes from Angora goats. Um, and the majority of these animals are bred in South Africa. And so that's where we conducted our investigation on 12 Angora goat farms there. And, and this is pricey stuff, right? I mean, mohair generally, when you have a mohair garment, it's yeah. generally one of the priciest uh, uh, items that you can buy at a at a clothing store, right? I mean, mohair Absolutely. pants, mohair suit. So usually, mohair is used for sweaters, like very mm -hmm. high end sweaters by more luxury high end brands. Um, and I really do, like you were saying, Emil, I feel like it's more expensive because it's so hard to take care of mohair. You wear it once and when you're ready to wash it, you can't just throw it in the laundry. You have to take this to the dry cleaners um, and really, you know, take good care of this product or else it's going to shrink. And you know, it comes with a lot of the same problems that wool does. But we often see mohair in soft sweaters or um, for men's and women's suits. Or even on like, you know, baby blankets and things like that. More about what PETA's investigation found that, that shows about the cruelty to the animals and to, for, yeah. to create these products. Before you have really any insight into these industries where animals are exploited and killed for fashion items, people tend to think, well, if the animal is getting sheared, it's probably just a haircut. For them, oftentimes, you know, we heard the same things from folks who were surprised to see what we found in the wool industry for sheep. Um, but the reality of it is that these workers are getting paid 
by how much volume uh, they're shearing off of these animals and not really by the hour or the time that they are you know, working in the sheds and on the farms. Um, so we saw that workers consistently were dragging goats by their horns, by their legs, slamming them onto the shearing floor, uh, holding them down as they were crying, whether because they were in pain, because they were being cut open by these shears, because the shears are mo moving so quickly to get the job done. Um, and some of these goats were considered spent by the shears and were taken to a different part of the shearing shed and had their throats slit with these dull knives. So these animals were writhing in pain and crying out in pain as it took several seconds for these workers to slit their throats and then finally break their necks. So the Washington Post broke the news of this really disturbing case once we had compiled all of this footage. Um, and even before we broke this story, uh, PETA shared these details of what was going on in these farms and sheds with some of the biggest fashion retailers in the world, uh, like Inditex, which owns Zara, um, Gap Inc., H&M, which is a huge you know, fashion brand, as you know, Arcadia Group, which owns Topshop and Top Man, um, and several other popular brands. And all of them, before it even broke, uh, agreed to place a ban on these products going forward. So by 2019 or 2020, all of these brands will be mohair free. And since you know, we've publicized the details of this investigation, we have now nearly 300 major global retailers and designers uh, that have decided to ban mohair from their collections. So similar to the Angora wool industry from a few years back, we've been able to essentially cripple this industry to extinction. I mean, no one really is buying mohair anymore. Yeah, it sounds like uh, they may have bought it because they thought it was exotic or they thought it was unusual or they liked mm -hmm. the feel or the look. And then maybe they mm -hmm. thought, oh, well, it's just like a haircut, but it's far from just a haircut. Since the publication and now since the arrest or the, uh, were they arrested or they just cite cited? the farmers they're cited now so they haven't been arrested yet mm -hmm. we'll see what comes of these charges um what happened in the wool industry through our you know we've been in dozens i think over 47 different shearing sheds um on three different continents looking into the wool industry and of the six charges that were pressed against shears for those investigations one shear pled guilty to the charges and is now no longer able to shear or work with any animals for the next two years. So we're hoping that we can get, you know, a similar outcome with these mohair charges. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot if you have one or you have four, you know, the numbers, mm -hmm. but the fact that, that you can highlight an instance and document an instance, a clear cut instance of cruelty has um, has this huge effect on the entire industry and on, on consumers, right? We're hoping that it's going to move the industry to hold itself more accountable and ensure that, you know, for, for the few farmers that will be left working in this industry, since there aren't many companies who are buying this product anymore, that they will take more care um, to, to not be so cruel to these animals. Now, you're the assistant manager of clothing campaigns. I explain mm -hmm. to us what that means and what kinds of clothing are we talking about here? So managing PETA's clothing campaigns, I'm looking at all of the various industries that exploit uh, and kill animals for our fibers that are out there on the fashion market. So that's the leather industry, exotic skins, wool, mohair, as we've just talked about. Um, you know, I am working with the rest of our team to organize these campaigns to bring our investigation findings to the public um, and also educate and inform, you know, people through our marketing campaigns as well as through private meetings with these companies that there are so many other materials out there that we can use in place of animal-derived fabrics. 
And they're not only better for animals, but they're so much better for the environment as well. So well, give an example uh, that, that people can, can follow. I guess for mohair, I mean, it, there's so many polyester and non-wrinkle fabrics or other kind of fabrics now that, but, but what is an example if you, if you really are dying to have a mohair or anything, yeah. um, what, what is an alternative? So for mohair and wool type products, people are looking for that little bit of rise on the fabric. Um, and that super soft and kind of like, uh, silky shine to the sweater and, um, lots of, you know, vegan fibers can do the same thing like bamboo, um, or hemp blends with organic cotton. Um, there's this soy based vegetable cashmere that's on the market now. That's a little bit more pricey, but you know, it's also part of that, um, luxury market. That's wait, a soy based, a soy based. Uh Veg- Soy based, uh, what they're calling vegetable cashmere. Vegetable cashmere. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, is is it really that soft? I mean, I think of vegetables it not is. exactly as being soft and like you'd rub your hands on a, <laughs> on a on a bunch of kale. Yeah, we have you know we have these suppliers sending us samples all the time, so that when we meet with companies. We can encourage them to use more of their fabrics. Um, so vegetable cashmere is one that we're often showcasing to companies to use instead of wool and mohair. Of course, there's like the more traditional stuff like tencel, which is actually um, from eucalyptus trees. And it's, it's better mm. for the environment. It's also really soft. Um, a lot of companies are using uh, fleece made from recycled plastic bottles, which mm. is really cool. Um, there's even like a vegan wool made from seaweed, like seaweed and, and hemp um, and uh, of more traditional things like modal, rayon, uh, polyester, as you mentioned. But like no matter what it is you're looking for, what we try to stress to folks is whether it's like more on the affordable side or you're looking for an item that's going to last you years and that's really going to retain its um, you know, soft hand feel for through many washings. There's, there's so many um, products out there for you to choose from that don't include animal fibers. Yeah. So after an investigation like uh, this and, you know, the breakthrough with the, uh, the charges, mm-hmm. people change their attitudes. As a campaigns worker, is the focus then on consumers or the companies? It's, it's both, honestly. So. We, we choose our high profile target for that investigation. Right now, for the mohair investigation, it's free people. We love free people for a lot of the good things that they do. They promote an extensive vegan leather collection. So we praise them often for that. But they are being very stubborn about dropping mohair because they mm. lo- like that um, soft and puffy look that it gives sweaters. But there, there are other things that they can use. So what we're doing right now is an extensive marketing campaign against free people, tagging them in all of our posts, making um, personalized videos to share on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, where PETA has millions of followers, urging people to go on free people's uh, social media pages, um, email their CEO and urge the company to drop mohair and let them know that it's not in line with the values of their consumers. So that's definitely a big part of it. So free people, and they make all sorts of garments? They do, yeah. They're they're a women's wear brand. They're within the anthropology and urban outfitters. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, so a guy like me wouldn't be wearing free people, but maybe I know some some people. I'm not surprised that you don't know who they are. Yeah, they're, oh, okay. they're definitely right. only women's wear at this point. All right. And then, all right, so that's that's a target. That's one of the big ones. But it also means that you're going after a younger crowd, too. We are. And the great thing about the younger crowd is that they're online. I heard a really interesting um, factoid from the marketing department recently, which was five years ago, PETA ha- received a million views on all of our videos across our social media platforms five years ago. Now we can receive 
a million views on something we post on one platform in one day. So that's really cool in that um, people are sharing our information. You know, the millennials and uh, Gen Z demographic, they're very interested um, in, in these issues, these social justice issues. They feel like they have a direct impact on their life. They want to do better. They want to make products and support products that are, you know, allowing the planet to be um, in a healthier condition, not just environmentally, but, you know, for animals and for themselves. And so they're really paying attention to these, to these issues that we're posting about. And they're getting in touch with the companies and letting them know that this isn't what I support. And so it's twofold. We have to reach the consumers. They have to take action with their dollars. They have to get out there and read the labels and put things back on the rack that are not in line with their values. They have to engage with these companies. We can't be the only ones engaging. Otherwise, you know, the companies will never know that their consumers care about this stuff. You see a lot of ugly video when it, you know, comes, when it, it's taken by the investigators and, you know, shown to you. I, I know I'm having trouble forgetting the images and the sounds of the goats screaming in the South African Angora farm. How do you mm -hmm. cope with this in particular? And what keeps you going to, to, to do the work you need to do? Being at PETA for nearly five years now, I've kind of developed a thick skin of watching this investigative footage, um, all of our videos that I have to review on a daily basis before they're posted and shared with companies. I've kind of, I, I feel that I've become a bit immune to really feeling it because I'm in constant engagement with it. But there are times when I won't even realize what's happening where I just, it, it's really difficult. Um, and I'll have to take a moment and, and just like regain my composure in the bathroom because it is when you really allow yourself to enter the footage and be there in the room with this animal that is suffering so immensely for something as fickle as a mohair sweater. Um, it, it just, it just becomes clear that this isn't, this isn't going to last very long. As soon as more people realize what's happening and they allow themselves to care for these animals, to really feel what the animal is feeling, we're going to enter a new phase of the fashion industry. And that is really what keeps me going because I know that it's possible, because I know that it happened for me. I know that a lot of people in my life who hear about our work, who you know, see all of the press hits of this company banning fur, that company, you know, ending their leather line and moving on to vegan leather. Um, they're really inspired by that. And, you know, the more victories that we have, the more people are going to realize that they're not alone in caring, um, that it's okay for them to jump on board this very important movement. And whether or not they jump on board, it's going to go without them. So I guess. I just want to be a small part of that. Any regrets uh, having left the military and joining the PETA army? <laughs> no, I honestly couldn't be happier with where I am today. Um, I think I really, five years ago, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I felt like my job in the military, yeah, when I was in the military, I, I just wasn't very enthusiastic about the work. Um, and now that I feel like I've found my sense of purpose, um, yeah, it's, it's really great to be able to say that I'm here now. I think I've, I've kind of always been a sensitive person to animals, but I was actually a senior in high school in Seoul when I came across my first PETA video. So that was the Meet Your Meat video that was narrated by Alec Baldwin. And I think it had recently been released. And to be honest with you, Emil, I, at 17 years old, really didn't have any idea that meat came from animals. I guess I had never like really thought about it. Mm -hmm. And um, when I watched 
this factory farm footage for the first time, it just broke my heart. And I went vegetarian then. And it took me a long time to get to be vegan. Um, that happened many years later when I was living in Hawaii with my family. We were all kind of living together in a one bedroom apartment. My father had been diagnosed with cancer uh, that year. And so we ended up spending the rest of the year living in this one bedroom apartment together, my sister, myself, and my parents trying to help him get better. And it was through that experience that I kind of came back to, the, to all the issues and realized that dairy and eggs and, um, you know, just how it's all interconnected and how I didn't want and to cause any animal to suffer through my actions. And after seeing my dad suffer so much, it was um, just very clear to me that it was all one and the same. So now you're not, not just vegan, but well, vegan in terms of eating, but in terms of everything, uh, you know, your, yeah. your clothing, your all animal products. <laughs> yeah. did, did, did that ever seem extreme to your family, your friends? Yeah, it definitely did at first. I mean, I was in the military, so I kind of followed my father's footsteps did ROTC in college, commissioned, you know, as an officer in the army. And I got to the end of my tour. That's why I was living in Hawaii in 2013. And I went vegan that year. So, but more than being just vegan, you know, like you were just saying, I learned about all of the issues and I realized that I wanted to be a bigger part of this movement. Um, so I was getting to the end of my contract in the army, just on a whim, sent out uh, an application to PETA and ended up here a few months later. But at the time, I remember all of my friends in the military were advising me against it, saying that you're going to be blacklisted from military or government work going forward. <laughs> PETA's crazy. They just want to make the whole world vegan. And I was like, that sounds pretty great. <laughs> um, and now you're, now you're a member of the PETA army. I'm part of the PETA army. And you know what? It's so funny because a lot of those same people who are advising me not to work for PETA are now vegan or very vegan friendly. So um, it's all a ripple. What did you leave the service with? What kind of uh, rank or what I mean, are you? I was a, a captain um, in the branch of public affairs in the army. So you only killed newsprint and uh, right. public relations right. people. No, <laughs> yeah. no enemies, no civilians. Absolutely. Well, that's, a, well, that's uh, well, that's good. Um, the military, so so different. I guess if you wanted a vegan meal in the military, mm -hmm. it would be it would be hard to do, huh? It was very difficult. Yeah, there were several trainings that I went to that year. Where the only thing that I could eat for a couple of weeks on end was the veggie burger. And I'm really not sure that the bread was even vegan in those mess halls. Um, so, you know, it, it's still tough. But I think as more and more folks are um, becoming vegan in the military and it's more talked about, there are more options available. And we do actually have vegan MREs, just a couple now. Oh, mm -hmm. the meals that are ready to eat, that people eat in the field. MREs, yeah, right. Yeah. Vegan MREs. So they people have in during the Iraq War, they did not have vegan MREs. I doubt they did. <laughs> but now they do, huh? Yeah. So now everyone could be well fed. The the Absolutely. both the meat eating warriors and the vegan warriors. Absolutely. All right. So so all right. So you went into the army. You would think that the army because it has this emphasis on discipline that it would mm -hmm. be easy not to eat meat, but unless you are so yeah. philosophically against not, not eating meat and you're like, I'm a meat eater, you know, you know, <laughs> I mean, I guess you, you had a lot of those types or I'm, you know, hell with Buddha, you know, right. I yeah. mean, I guess that, that happened a lot because I mean, because the masculinity is a thing in the military for sure. Because the, the whole image of, of the army is discipline. If you, mm -hmm. if you could not eat meat and it was part of your values and principles, it, you know, you just wouldn't do it, right? You'd obey the command and that's my orders. I'm not eating meat, but I guess they fight against that. Or it's not well, part of their values. It's just not part of the value system just yet. Um, 
at least in large part. There are a lot of folks who I met in the military who were more plant-based, but you'd never really heard of a soldier being vegan. I think I was the only one in the command. <laughs> yeah. Now, now are there more, you think? I think there are more. I mean, I continue, like, we have this Sexiest Vegan Next Door contest that PETA hosts every year. Um, and you see a lot of military folks who are entering, who are vegan, talking about how they're encouraging their mess halls or their PX cafeterias and stuff to have more vegan options. You have firefighters that are vegan and helping, you know, all of their um, guys who they work with to try more plant-based options. So I think it's it's uh, definitely a movement that's growing. You see a lot more uh, bodybuilders who are talking about how much stronger and, um, you know, how much easier it is for their muscles to recover on a vegan diet and a lot more athletes that are going vegan. So I think definitely uh, that narrative is, is changing for um, dudes who who want to be, you know, want to have this like masculine image. And now they, they realize like, you don't have to eat animals in order to be a man. Christina Sewell, PETA's assistant manager of clothing campaigns on how PETA's mohair investigation continues to break new ground this time getting animal cruelty charges filed in South Africa and forcing everyone to think twice about using mohair. But there's still some companies holding out, like uh, the brand Free People, among others. That's Free People. You use it? you know it? Take action. Go to PETA.org and let companies know that animals aren't ours to abuse and wear. Click on the show notes or go to PETA.org. And that's our show for today. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me at Twitter uh, at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. <laughs>